Hey guys, Stuart from Lambden here. I wanted to do a quick update on where we are with Flora, which is our distributed smart contract package manager um, that is designed to be ubiquitous uh, across all different smart contracting languages that may exist in the future, uh, retain decentralized and distributed data store, and what I'm going to demonstrate today, uh, add some extra functionality uh, to the state of the tech that we're currently in, which is mostly Solidity. So, um, oopsies. So last time I went through uh, uploading a token, uh, token contract, or pulling it down, installing it on Saffron. And so what was interesting about that uh, token is that um, it took two parts. If you haven't looked at our TSOL, uh, repository. I would suggest you do that, but I'll go through it real quick. So basically last time I installed, I think it was Stuart ERC20, something similar like that. I'm just going to do here. And now if you notice, there's two pieces to this puzzle. One is the contract, except the contract seems to have these handlebars that denote certain variables. And then if you scroll down to the end, there's this payload that fills it in. So you can see total supply here, and this colon, and that's one million. If we scroll up here, we have total supply filled in there. So what this allows you to do is to define a, an abstract contract. So you only have to define these variables, and you can produce 100 200 contracts with various different payloads and they're all going to work the same. So that's interesting. Um, but it's not too crazy when the information is just static. You're pretty much just naming some arbitrary things. Okay, the symbol doesn't really matter. Asset name, cool. Um, it doesn't really show the power of this. So I've created a different smart contract. And this one is modeling a database. So if you're familiar with databases, um, your data objects are modeled in a thing called a table. And each table has certain attributes. And you can do certain things on those, those tables, add entries, pull entries, things like that. And so I call this one DB table. I'm going to do it here. Now this one's a little bit different uh, because if you notice, there's not just the, the handlebars, but there's also this um, four key value instruct items. And what this is describing is a for loop. Uh, and this is an abstract kind of concept here. You have the static contract. This is always going to be the same. And then you have this for loop that's essentially saying, look, we're going to take something called a struct. It's going to be a dictionary and we're going to generate these variables in it with a value key. Now this might not make sense right now, but if you go and you look down at the example payload that was used to upload it um, initially, and um, if you remember, you have to, when you're using TSOL and you decide to use these variables, you have to provide an example payload to complete it, and it has to compile. And so if you look at that uh, example payload, you see that there's struct here, and then inside of struct are different types of uh, objects. And so this is a book, and it has a title, which is a string, an author, which is a string, and an owner, that is an Ethereum address. And so if you take this struct, and now you come back here and you look at this, you start to realize, oh, what this is doing is it's iterating through each of these items and writing out the code. So what this will actually write out is string title, string author, address owner. And you can have this thing 500 variables long and it will dynamically fill that up. And so that's interesting because now you have a single contract that has a lot more functionality, has a lot more uh, dynamic than a traditional smart contract. Um, and that allows you to do a lot of cool things. And so 
To add on to this, uh, what we've programmed is a generate tool. So you can do generate, and now this is in a DB table. That should pop it up. So basically, this is a way for you to generate smart contracts on the fly without really knowing anything about programming or necessarily knowing anything about the underpinnings of how it works. So if you know that this is uh, the contract that you want to deploy, you can fill in certain things like we're going to call this uh, a car. And now what this will do now is iterate through that struct. So the key is going to be, let's call it make, it's a string, model, string, year, unsigned int, perfect. And so now you can see we have this make model year and the different variables assigned to it. And it looks similar to this in the structure, but the actual contents much different. And so let's, uh, let's generate. We can generate the contract and we'll fill it in, or we can just export that implementation and generate the contracts later. So let's generate it and we're going to call it car. And we should, and I think it might, let's see. Yeah, it'll, it'll compile it to this location if we do. There we go. So now you can see that we have the string make, string model, unsigned in year up here. So this describes what a car is. And you can get each of these attributes. And these are filled in. So that's pretty cool. Now, what I have done is I have essentially described several objects. And so this is going to demonstrate what the real power here is. So um, in object-oriented programming or different programming paradigms, um, especially in database uh, design and development, you want to define things. And to define things, they have different attributes. So if you're a uh, credit card company, you're going to have certain things on file, like a person's address, phone number, identifying information. You might want like a username and a password, and those things might have different attributes as well. And so you might have a person has an address, and then that address would have a street, a state, um, you know, different things such as that. Or you would say a person has a payment method. And that payment method would be a credit card, and they could have multiple credit cards. And so those credit cards each have different attributes, right? Like the, the uh, main card number, the back usually has a little three or four digit number as well, expiration date, uh, things like that. And so this is really useful because now you don't have to write these contracts if you want to create a database structure in Ethereum or on a blockchain, you can just define the objects themselves. And then what Flora is going to do with TESOL is generate all that stuff on the fly for you. So you just have to work on creating your models. And as the software develops, this is obviously going to be put into more of a front end user interface. So you don't even have to worry about this um, encoding and making it you know, JSON compliant. And so once that's fleshed out, I mean, the power is, is um, kind of unchained. And what's really exciting is that I'm seeing this as being a potential use case to describe um, a database. But there's infinite number of things that you can describe with this templating system. And so it's going to be really interesting as this project develops, especially as the development community gets on board, you know, what are other people with different experiences and different needs going to use the software for? And then because we have it all in a package manager, now I can add somebody else's smart contract to my database system and make something new and better even. And so that's, that's what we're capturing here. But anyways, so I have different um, objects. So building off the car thing again, I pulled this out and so, you know, Made this real quick. So we have make, model, year, 
model's probably a string. Year's probably an unsigned int. Mileage is probably an unsigned int. And price is probably an unsigned int. So we're going to save this. We have a dealership, and the dealership has a name, street address, city revenue. And what I'm describing here is an imaginary but potential use case where a dealership or a group of dealerships is wants to store data and information about certain things uh, for their business. And so there's dealerships, there's cars, and then there's owners. And so each of the dealership has certain attributes, each of the owners has certain attributes, and each of the cars has certain attributes. And so now you can store all these things, pass them through blockchains and things like that. So what I also added was, this is very short script, 10 lines. Um, what it basically does is it loads the template. And this is the same template that we pulled from before. And it goes through each of the files at ends and JSON, generates a contract, comes up with the name, and spits that out as solidity. And that's pretty much it. So now, taking a group of these, all we have to do is run this. And there you go. You can see that now we have all of these created automatically. And then these can be deployed, you know, piped into whatever you're working on. So it's really just that simple. It's, it's less worrying about the intricacies of what, you know, Pragma Solidity 0.414 is, worrying about what the struct is like. I mean, you know about your business. You know there's certain things that you want to accomplish. You should be focusing on that and allowing the underpinnings to be automated because that's what computers are for. Um, and so this is where we're headed, and I hope it gives more of an illumination to what's happening with this project. Um, I'll be doing more of these videos as more of this stuff gets produced, um, and so I hope this does really illustrate uh, what this project's all about. So thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, comment. If you have any questions, and I'll be sure to answer them.